This is Math 151. We're going to look at section 4.7, which is about um, optimization. And optimization is anytime you want to uh, optimize, like maximize or minimize something. So, for example, uh, you might want to maximize production or minimize production costs or maximize profit or um, minimize the amount of time something takes, stuff like that. Maybe even maximize gas mileage. So, here's a problem. So we have 100 feet of fencing, uh, of wire fencing, and we want to make this rectangular garden. Um, but one side is going to be built alongside a wall. So uh, it's going to look like that, where we have the wall, and just the three sides are the fencing. And so uh, let's call these X, Y, and X. So the 100 feet of fencing is this part right here the two X's and the Y. So we know a couple things about this garden. We know that uh, two X plus Y equals 100 because there's 100 feet of fencing that we're going to use. And we also know that the area is is X times Y. And what we want to do is we want to maximize the area. We want to make that area as big as possible. So um, let's express this area in terms of just one variable. So right now it's X times Y. Um, so I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for y and substitute that into there. So I can subtract 2x from both sides, All right? like y equals negative uh, 2x. And so that means I could express the area as x times y, which is negative 2x plus 100. And if I multiply that out, uh, then the area is negative 2x squared plus 100x. And I want to maximize that. And in other words, like if I think about the shape, this is a upside down parabola, right? Like I know the shape's going to look like that. I want to make that as big as I can. I want the most area that I can get. So how about I find the derivative and then find a max min on it? Let's take that derivative of a. Be negative 4x plus 100. Yeah, perfect. And uh, what I want to know is I want to know when is that derivative equal to zero, right? Like, when is it flat? Hopefully that's a max min. So negative 4x plus 100 equals zero. And it looks like x would be 25 then. Um, let's see, I could plug that back in here to figure out the y value. Negative 2 times 25 plus 100, which is 50. So if we make a 25 by 50 garden that will maximize the area that'll give us the biggest area and that area is I could plug it back in and find out what the actual area is um, I could plug it back into this equation with just X or this equation knowing both X and Y uh, I'll do that one 25 times 50 that's uh, 12,000 I'm sorry 1,250 square feet all right so that's the biggest area I can get using 100 feet of wire fencing where I make a rectangle one side against the wall. So this is an interesting problem. Uh, we're supposed to build an open top box from a 24 by 36 inch cardboard piece. So we have this rectangular piece of cardboard that's 24 by 36. And we're going to build an open top box uh, by removing a square from each corner and folding up. So we would take a square away and I'll just call this X right and these are squares all the same size and then what would happen is you would uh, fold up those sides to make a an open top box so let's think about um, the dimensions of it we're supposed to maximize the volume of this box make it as big as we possibly can so if I think about this, this whole side is, is 24 long. And if I take away X and X, that makes uh, this side 24 minus 2X, right? Like 24 is the whole thing minus this X minus 6X. And similarly, this side is 36, but it's also minus 2X. Take away that X and that X in its length, right? How long is that? And the height is X because I've folded it up here and here. So um, 
you know, when you're doing this type of problem, one to think, thing to think about is what is your uh, what is your domain? What are your possible inputs into it? And really, I think that x could run from zero to twelve because uh, that gives me like a side length of twenty four down to a side length basically of zero. And it's probably not inclusive like this. It's probably soft brackets, but I'm only going to consider values for x between 0 and 12 because anything else doesn't doesn't matter to make the box like it doesn't even make sense volume then volume of a box is length times width times height so that would be one of the sides multiplied by another side multiplied by the third side and if I multiply that out of course you can multiply however however you want but as I go to multiply that out um, Multiply these two together, distribute that x into there, and I get 4x cubed minus 120x squared uh, plus 864x. So there's the volume relative to x. If, you, In other words, if you tell me how big one side is uh, of the square that we're going to cut out of each corner, plug it into here, I get the volume. And I want to maximize this volume, so let's take the derivative. So take the derivative of this. Uh, 12x squared minus 240x plus 864. And again, I have a quadratic here. And what I want to do is I want to uh, I want to maximize I want to maximize this volume, right? Like so, I want to know when this is equal to zero. Okay, so I'm going to solve that. Set that thing equal to zero. 12x squared minus 240. Well, I notice I can factor out a 12. That might make it easier. So really, I just have to solve that part now. And uh, that looks like it's not going to be factorable. So I'm going to run it through the quadratic formula. And I have it programmed into my calculator. So I get it spits out 10 plus or minus uh, 2 root 7. All right, so I have two possibilities uh, for max mins for this cubic, right? I, when, when I set this derivative equal to 0, I'm finding possible max min values for, for this. And we want to maximize this. We want to make it as big as possible. You know, my domain is 0 to 12 so I can throw out 10 plus 2 root 7 that's that's bigger than 12 All right 10 plus 2 alone is 12 and this is bigger than 2 so 10 minus 2 root 7 it's probably my value um, so I think that that's the size that I want to make X and if I want to figure out what the actual volume is I can plug it back in so um, 10 minus 2 root 7 and I'm going to plug that into my volume here I'm just going to do that on my calculator 1825 cubic uh, inches so there is my maximized volume that's what the volume is when it's maximized and this is the side length of the square to cut out that will maximize that volume that will yield that So on this problem, uh, there's a beach, there's some island that's two miles from it. So there's the island. <laughs> Look at that. Um, that's an island. Big point of an island. And then there's a cabin that's six miles on the beach uh, away from this point that's directly away from the island. And uh, there's a person who wants to travel uh, from this cabin to the to the island and so they're gonna they're gonna run part of the way and they're gonna swim part of the way so notice they could run 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 all the way to here and then swim all the way to here or they could just swim straight across but they swim you know significantly slower than they run so you could have them run for a while and then swim for a while and so the question is how far should they should they run before they jump in the water and swim to, to minimize the trip time to get there as quick as possible 
So, in other words, there's some point, uh, I suspect, where if they ran for a while and then swim, that would be the shortest uh, time it would take them to get the trip. So let's see what we got here. Let's call this X. That's what we're looking for. How far should they run before swimming to minimize the trip time? Um, clean up some stuff. That means that this would be 6 minus X miles, right? The, the total 6. And we want to minimize it. So first off, we're going we're gonna to need an equation for the, the trip um, in terms of time. And then we'll take the derivative to try and minimize it. So let's think about distance equals rate times time, which means that uh, time equals distance divided by rate. Good. So if we think about how much time it takes them to run, that's their distance running, which would be uh, x, divided by uh, their rate of running, and that's 8 miles per hour. And for now, let's just call this y, just to simplify our work. And then the time it takes for them to swim would be the distance swimming, which is, which is this y. So we know that the, the total time to do this trip would be x over 8 plus y over 3. Right, the time it takes to run plus the time it takes to swim. All right, now if I go to take the derivative of this now, it's in two variables. I'm going to get this y in terms of x, just so I only have one variable to deal with, make it easier. So I notice here I have a right triangle. So I can use Pythagorean theorem, which would tell me that um, y squared would equal 2 squared plus uh, 6 minus x squared, which means that y is the square root of that. And that, that's a 4. And I think that I'll just leave that 6 minus x squared like that. I could multiply it out. Uh, I think I'll just leave it like that. It's just a style choice. You could, you could multiply it out if you wanted. So that means then uh, my total time would be x over 8 plus y over 3. But I know that y is this thing. Okay. Cool, so let's take the derivative of that then. So the derivative uh, relative to x, here it's just 1 8 plus, uh, I've still got the third. And if I take the derivative of this, so square root, I'm going to have to chain rule this thing. So it's a 1 half, 4 plus 6 minus x squared to the negative 1 half. And now I have to take the derivative of this. That's, that's going to be times because I'm chain ruling this 6 minus x squared. So that would be uh, 2. This is times 2 times uh, x 6 minus x to the first power. And the derivative of negative x is negative 1. So this 2 and times a negative 1. So this is all multiplied together up top. Boy, that's a mess. I'm going to clean this up. 1 eighth. Let's see, the 1 half, the 2 comes down, so we've got a 6 down in the denominator. This is a negative 1 half power, so this comes to the denominator as well. And this is a negative 2 times 6 minus x. And I could clean this up even a little bit more. Uh, since this is negative, let's turn this into subtraction. Take it out here, and 2 and the 6 cancels out to make just a 3 down there. So there's my derivative right there. And what I want to know is when does that thing, <laughs> that big mess, equal 0? All right, so when this thing equals 0, 1 8 has to equal that. Like I could add that to both sides. Like this equals 0, add this thing to both sides, 1 8 equals that. So let's, let's go from there. 1 8 equals 6 minus x over... Um, multiply both sides by both denominators. So this gets multiplied by 1, this gets multiplied by 8. Uh, I want to get rid of that square root. I'm going to square both sides. So uh, how about we distribute that 9 into there? 
So right now, at this point uh, with this problem, you have a decision to make and you could really just power this out, right? Like multiply that out, multiply that out, distribute the nine, distribute the six, collect like terms. But if you're, if you're feeling kind of clever, you can notice that this is nine times six minus X squared and this is 64 times six minus X squared. So like if this was an A, you could think of this as a nine, eight and nine A and this is a 64 A. So I could subtract this from both sides because they're like terms. And that tells me that 36 is equal to, uh, and then from here, divide both sides by 55. Uh, I can square root that. So six minus X equals plus or minus square root of 36 is six. Let's just leave this as root 55. Um, do, do, do. I'm going to subtract six from both sides. Divide by that negative. So boom, boom, plus or minus still stays plus or minus. So I've got two answers here. Uh, one of them being uh, six plus six over root 55. And one of them being six minus six over root 55. And now if I think back to my domain, my possible answer is X, X has to be between zero and six like it makes no sense to run more than six miles and then and then swim back so we're going to keep x between zero and six and this one is clearly bigger than six so there's my answer uh right there that's what my um that's what my possibility is now i don't know that that's actually the answer right because the endpoints could be the answer it could actually be be fastest just to swim all the way. Or it could be fastest to run and then swim. It's probably not, but I should check. I'm going to make a little space here. So I'm going to take this formula for uh, for my time, and I'm going to plug in 0, 6, and that, and see which one is, is actually the maximum. right? And now I'm not using the, the derivative. I'm using the actual time equation, because I want to know which one uh, minimizes that time, makes it the smallest. I think I said that before. I hope I didn't say maximize it. So my equation is uh, for first off, I'll just put zero into x, and my equation is here. So so if we just swam, it would take uh, two point one. What was that? Uh, two point one oh eight hours. If we ran all the way and then swam, it would take 1.416 hours. So actually, it, it it is less time to run all this way and then swim than just to swim all the way across. That's how much faster running is. But if we only run part of the way, the 6 minus 6 over root 55, It only takes 1.368 hours. And these are, I really should be saying about here. So that does minimize it. And that value do, 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 is about 5.19 miles, most of the way. So that's how far one should run. This is it exactly. Uh, in order to minimize the time it takes to get from there all the way to there. So this car rental company, uh, they, they're going to charge P dollars per day, whatever that is, uh, and the number of cars N uh, that they rent per day can be modeled by this price right here. So if they charge uh, $100, it's 1,000 minus 5 times 100. That's how many cars they would rent per the day, right? So the higher they charge, uh, the, the fewer cars that they will rent per day, uh, according to this model. And P, here's our domain on P, 50 to 200. If, if they only charge $50 per day, all the cars are rented out. If they charge um, $200 per day or more, none, none of the cars will get rented. So we're going to let P sit between uh, 50 and 200. So the more they charge, the more money they get per car, but uh, they get fewer cars out, out there. 
that they get to charge on. So how much should they charge to maximize revenue? What's that balance between raising the price just enough so they still sell uh, or rent out enough cars that they that they make the most money? So let's think about some pieces here. Um, so first off, we have um, two variables. How much it costs, P dollars per day, and how many cars they rent per day, N. So if I if I think about um, the revenue, right, like how much money they make, I know that it's P times N. How much they charge per car times the number of cars. And we also know that N can be expressed in terms of P as this. So instead of having two variables, let's say we take the revenue in terms just of P. So it's uh, how much they charge per day per car times uh, the price, uh, I'm sorry, the number of cars that will get rented out for that day. So notice the revenue is the price times the number of cars rented. And what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to maximize this. We know it runs from 50 to 200. So it could be that the most money is made, uh, well, it's not going to be at 200 because, you know, no cars are rented, so they make zero. But it could be at this end point, or it could be somewhere else. Let's, let's find the derivative of this. And uh, it might be easier to multiply this out. So distribute that P into there, 1,000P minus 5P squared. And if I take the derivative of that, this is 1,000 minus 10P. Nice. So when is that equal to zero? That'll be a max min, right? Uh, subtract 1,000 divided by negative 10. It looks like P is 100. So that could be a minimum. That could be a maximum. We will find out. So R at 50. So I'm going to take this 50 and plug it back into this equation, right? My, my revenue equation. So at 50 cars, uh, we get that much, but let's see at 100 cars. Oh, we do better, 50,000. And just for form, I'll check that other that other endpoint. And I know that that's a zero. <laughs> Don't earn anything. So yeah, that definitely maximizes uh, the profit. So they should charge $100 per car per day. That will maximize their profits. Uh, not their profits, sorry, their revenue. So we want to take a rectangle and inscribe it in an ellipse. And this is the equation for this ellipse. So basically, we have some ellipse. Oh boy, that's really not good. We have some ellipse. We're going to fit a rectangle in it. And you know, there's a lot of rectangles we could fit in it. You know, we could do that one. We could do one like this. But we just want to make it so the rectangle just fits inside it. Right, we have all these different possibilities, but we want to find the, the rectangle that has the biggest area possible. So um, we want to maximize that area. So we're going to need to find some equation for the area of that rectangle, then take its derivative and test some regions. So let's see. Um, well, I basically have some length and some width. So I know that area equals length times width. So let's try and get this in terms of x and y. So x, y is some uh, vertex of the, of the rectangle. And I know that that is going to be also on the ellipse, right? Because it's inscribed inside of it. Um, I also know that this ellipse has some nice symmetry right across like like this distance and this distance are the same this distance and this distance are the same 
this ellipse is centered at zero zero so my rectangle would have like kind of its weight center at zero zero two so this length then if this distance right here is x that distance right there is x <laughs> then the length has to equal 2x, right? Like this is over x up y, so the length is two of those, and the width is, is 2y. So I could also express this as uh, 2l, I'm sorry, 2x times 2y. Okay, but it's still in both x and y, and take the derivative of that isn't gonna help me. So also know the relationship between x and y has to be this. I know that x squared over four plus y squared has to be one. So I think what I'm gonna do, I know what I'm gonna do is solve this for y and then substitute it into there so that everything's in terms of x. Yeah, so I'm gonna subtract the x squared over four from each side, square root it. And since this is a this is a distance, I'm just going to keep it positive. That's I think I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, so that means that my area is two x times two times y, which is this times the square root of one minus x squared over four. Great, so now I have an equation for the area just in terms of x. You know, the furthest, the thing about, I now know about ellipses is this four gives me that, that axis right there. So the furthest it goes out is the square root of, of four, which is two. So my domain is gonna be zero to two. My x value itself cannot be bigger than two because if it was, this is outside of the ellipse. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, yeah. I think definitely. Um, so this is a 4x and I could think of this this one as a 4 fourths and notice if I do that then these have a common denominator so I could rewrite this as, as 4 minus x squared over 4 and then since these are both square rooted square root of 4 is 2 which cancels that 4 out so that leaves me 2x times root 4 minus x squared. I think that's going to just be a lot easier to deal with. So if that's my area, do, 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 and I have my domain for x 0 to 2, let's take the derivative of that thing. And the derivative of this, I can, I can chain rule that. So derivative of the first plus uh, the first times derivative of the second. And so taking the derivative of the second, um, that, so I'm doing product rule, and then I have to do chain rule inside my product rule. So derivative of this is one half of that to the negative one half. And then I have to take the derivative of what's in here with my chain rule, which would be negative two x. So this is, All right, so notice uh, this two got divided out by that one half. X times X gives me the X squared. This is negative square root, so it's in the denominator. And this is negated because of that negative sign. So we wanna know, when does that equal zero? And when this equals zero, these two things must equal each other. So, that equals that. Notice if I multiply both sides by this root of four minus x squared, I have it times itself, which gets rid of my square root, which gives me, I could divide both sides by two, get rid of that two. Add x squared to both sides. Whew. Divide by two. Uh, x equals plus or minus root two. I can just take the plus case. So if that's the case, uh, I know what x is, so I know the length is uh, two of those, right? Length was two x's, so the length would be two of these root twos. And then I could get figure out what uh, what the area is 
by substituting this root two value back into this formula right here for area. It's a lot of stuff in there. This is uh, two times root two times the square root of, this is four minus two, root two. Root two times root two is two, two times two is four. So my area uh, would be four. So a rectangular box with a square base, so we know that this is something by something, uh, something by itself, and an open top, um, also has some certain height, let's call it y. We know that the volume is 216. So volume, that would be x times x times y is 216 cubic inches. And what we would like to do is uh, find the dimensions that have that volume uh, but minimize the surface area. So let's get an equation for the surface area would be the, the area of the base is x times x, so x squared, plus, and then we have these four sides that are x by y, so 4xy. So there's our surface area, and we the top is open, open top, so we don't have to count it. And what we want to do is... Uh, I'll use S for surface area. We want to minimize that. So we're going to take the derivative of it and, and find a minimum. And I think that, yeah, this is in two variables, X and Y. So I'm going to get this just in terms of X. So if I solve this for Y, divide both sides by X squared, 216 divided by X squared. So uh, X squared plus 4 times X times uh, 216 over x squared. And those x's, that cancels that out. 4 times 216 is 860. So there's my surface area uh, in terms of just x. And so let's take the derivative of it. 2x, and then that's a x to the negative 1, so negative 864 over x squared. And we want to know when that's equal to zero. When it's equal to zero, these things are equal to each other. So multiply both sides by x squared, divide by 2, and cube root that thing. Whoops, that was cubed. And uh, that's 6 cube root of 2. Great. So that is the x value. Um, we could find its y value then by plugging this into here. So y would be 216 over 6 third root of 2 squared. Gee, that's like 3 cube root of 2. So the dimensions are two of these, the x is for the base, one of these for the height, and then we could actually find what the surface area is uh, by plugging those both into this equation or just plugging this one into that equation. Now, if you were to give these answers to me in terms of um, decimals, rounded off, that would be okay using your calculator. All right, hey, check out those problems. Let me know what questions you have, post them in the forum, or uh, message me with them.